And I work on a lot of strategic programs there. And I actually started getting interested in licensing issues about 15 years ago when I was in management at Freescale. And there, in order to sell our silicon, we actually needed to provide a reference board. And to provide that reference board, it was, Linux was the obvious choice with U-Boot and a tool chain and a basic root file system. And so in order for us to ship out that software, we had to obey the licenses. We had to figure out what they were. My tool of choice at that point in time was grep. I did a lot of grepping work. This was before Frostology even showed up on the radar. But grep was very, very popular. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was a lot of manual, but the kernel was a lot smaller then. And a root file system had a very limited number of packages, only about 500. So it was still reasonably doable. Um, however, in the time since then, we've been seeing this tremendous proliferation of licenses as well as all the software. The whole Android ecosystem hit us, okay? And if people wanted to ship a reference system with Android, there was a lot of stuff that had to be done there. Uh, and so now when you started to try to use grep and you looked for license key phrases in licensing, it became harder. Uh, Phosology's done a lot of work on recognizing the common heuristics and it's available for everyone to use. It's open source, downloadable free. Um, but as people have continue to work with licensing at the source code level, it's starting to become almost an AI problem or a machine learning problem. Uh, last summer, one of the Google Summer of Code projects in Phosology was to apply machine learning into license scanning. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but this kind of seems like uh, garbage in, garbage out, and maybe we're solving the problem in the wrong spot. So we started looking mostly, I guess a couple years ago, but I'm more and more convinced of it, is we really need to be able to look at doing a grep again. And the licensing information needs to be clear enough that we can just grep for it, have a very simple script, generate the information, and then automate what we're gonna do with it. So if a license calls for you to ship something, um, what you wanna do is you wanna automate um, the compliance information with it. If it's GPL and you want to ship the source, you want to automate and comply. Basically generate the sources and put them in a tarball and things like that. If it's calling for uh, attribution notices to be made, you want to have a boilerplate attribution notices, you want to fill the information in and generate it. For that matter, you want to be able to generate the summary of the information every time you do a build. So getting to the stage where we're able to actually do this is um, something we should be able to work back towards doing grep against. So one of the things we've been sort of looking at is, I've been involved in the SPDX project pretty much for about eight, 10 years now. And there's license identifiers that people have standardized on. Most of these are the common open source license identifiers. And at the end of the day, being able to say git grep dash h with a key word, that is significant, and then find the licensing is kind of a good goal because that'll get rid of the garbage out of the ecosystem and a lot of the bad references. I'll go to more. Right now, um, you can talk to me afterwards if you want more details, but I talked to three different companies, and every time they want to ship a new Linux kernel or update their Linux kernel, it takes about 80 hours of manual effort on top of the, open source, on top of the tooling to, for them to clear the licensing so they feel confident that they have respected all the licenses there. And to me, that seems, okay, you can make a couple security fixes and all of a sudden you have to you know, force this whole big effort again. Now you can store it in databases and you store the results and you can work from there. But having to go through that level, again, seems to me to be, uh, we're solving the wrong problem. We need to really solve the fundamentals here. And we started doing some work on the Linux kernel. When I first started this, I got the question, well, it's all just GPL2 only, isn't it? Um, well, we've got 27 years of accretion into the kernel, and we've got files that have come in and drivers that have come in from other projects. We have stuff that's shipped out to other projects, and a lot of dual licensing has emerged, as well as, obviously, the GPL. And when we talk about the GPL, there's actually a bunch of variants. If you actually look at the words, there were six variants um, that the FSF labeled GPL2. They didn't put subversions on it. 
And we see elements of all of these and text from all of these into our kernel. Version variant four was the one that was actually in the copying file. It is substantially the same, but when you're using scanners, they pick up on these things. So we had that problem. We also had the problem that the user space API files um, have an explicit note of rights that the authors wanted to be respected. And that wasn't part of the GPL. So we had missing note, and so we ended up working with the SPX community to, call, to create a Linux syscall note so that we could encode that decision. There's a really good write-up in LKML for those who are interested. And um, there's details about the FSF work that Philippe Aubadam did in terms of tracing the provenance of the variants of the FSF GPL version two. The other thing is when you're looking at the kernel itself, um, obviously in addition to user space API files, the code is shared with other projects, so you see a lot of dual licensing. Um, you also see their build tools, which are not just generally GPL2. There are other licenses in there. There's testing files. There's a documentation. All of these things are in the kernel today. And that's fine. You can build a GPL2 binary and go. But when you're just doing a straight grep and looking at things, how do you know what you have to pay attention to or not? And so these are the challenges that people who are actually shipping products with Linux are dealing with. So you saw me referencing SPDX identifier. What they are is um, there's a license list. There's actually a group of lawyers that meets every two weeks. And it's up on GitHub. You can ask for a license to be added. And they come up with a standard identifier. Usually it's one suggested by the author who wants it added. And then there is a, that license has been codified. And um, the parts that things have to match have been identified. And things that are variable have been identified. So you can actually go and create tools to match against licensing and see whether or not it's valid. But we've also gone and we've got the licenses identified that the FSF has blessed as FSF Free Libra. So we've been working with the FSF to make sure that licenses they care about are called out. And then we have the licenses that are OSI approved also called out. And this is all encoded in with these licenses so that people can find it. And then the, broad, the formal text of the license is there as well as the source. But there is a user API and people have been downloading it and using these, this database. And people can pretty much add to it um, by requesting that the that legal committee review it. And then they'll add the license in. So we've got about 300 and that really has been catching a large part of the ecosystem up till now. Um, and then we've been handling some of the interesting cases with the syscall notes and so forth. So the SPTX license identifiers, um, there are matching guidelines for them, which I was alluding to before. And you can also use these identifiers in um, and or with and plus, which means generally or later. So we've got, you can set up expressions and you can use bracketing to set precedence. And when you start combining files from many places, it becomes useful. One of my colleagues at the Linux Foundation who does a lot more license clearing day to day nowadays than I do, actually um, had a very complicated expression that had almost 30 different license terms in it. And when you start working with like, things like the whole Java ecosystem and where people are having composable files and take one from one, one from another, another, that sort of thing happens. We don't have that situation in the Linux kernel. We're much cleaner that way, but it does exist in the wild. So coming up with ways that we can handle this stuff programmatically and recognize it and be unambiguous is something that we want to see happen to make it all better for everyone. If you want to understand um, how these IDs are used, there's a link here at the bottom, um, and it just sort of shows you the syntax that's in there. So again, why do you want to use them? Well, I'm making the hypothesis that when you start using them, we can start grepping for them, or we can create much, much, much simpler scripts than having to go into machine learning. And um, to give you a couple of examples, um, Open InfiniBand um, put a driver into the kernel in 2004. Open InfiniBand, if you look on the website, is a clause BSD. 
Okay, cool. What's actually in the kernel is the first part of two clause BSD and the disclaimers of MIT. They actually created a new license. And it was done purely by accident. But when we're going back, uh, I guess what, 15 years now of code, companies no longer exist that have these copyright statements. People are not necessarily trackable anymore. Um, how do we basically clean up those 659 files? Well, we actually end up working with the uh, license team at SPDX and we added a, a specific license identifier um, as Linux OpenIB so that this stuff can be tagged and cleaned up. But cargo cult copying is real. <laughs> okay, everyone copies. Oh, I'm using this file server like this. Okay, I'll just use that license copy and paste. The trouble is when a mistake starts out at the start, no one catches it. It keeps propagating. And so reducing the mistake attack surface effectively, to use a term, and giving the, minimizing the chance for people to get things wrong um, helps us get the whole thing better. Um, another thing, example that I spotted in um, version 13, 4.13, and when I checked last week, it was still there, is this one, GPL'd. If anyone here in the audience works for Red Hat, can you please go in and fix this? I want to find a new example, okay? <laughs> um, but some, you know, they basically say this is GPL'd. By default, the scanners will default this to be um, GPL 1.0 plus, 1.0 or later. That's the default. That's the only thing they can assume. Now, realistically, they probably meant it was GPL 2 or later, or GPL 2, when they put it in. However, as a scanner or someone doing the clearing or coming in after the fact, other than Red Hat, we can't make an authoritative statement. And this stuff is prevalent in the, in the kernel. If you grab, you'll find them pretty easily. Or I've given you the link to it, actually, so you can see it for yourself. And then we have developers who have good senses of humor, but that breaks scanners. Okay? Um, terms versus therms. Yeah, we all laugh at it. We see it once and laugh at it. But every time, you, if you have to see it over and over and over again, it breaks your scanners over. You have to start programming special cases into your scanner so you don't have to see it. And all of this removes the um, ability for us to automate. So coming up with identifiers that actually mean what you want, yes, you can insert your jokes, but then we don't have to scan for them and trip up on them is kind of the goal. The other reason we need to start looking at getting this cleaned up is um, the kernel's changing rapidly. We started looking at doing some of this work back in 4.13. We're now up to 4.20, actually five. And in that entire range, we've been seeing eight to nine changes per hour on the kernel. That's a fantastic rate of change. Actually, in um, the 4.20, when it switched up to 4.20, um, it was closer to 9.3 changes per hour. So it's almost heading towards 10 changes per hour now. And it hasn't shown any signs of stopping. <laughs> um, but when you're changing things that often, we've got to automate things to keep the consistency in play. And so that's a, probably another reason to stop the garbage from propagating quite so much. And then at the file level, we're also seeing code move from one project to another very commonly now. Oh, I see this function over here. I'm going to just copy it. If you don't have the file information labeled at the file level, you lose the information about which files, which licensings apply. Um, we actually um, did some analysis in early 2016 about um, Debbie's Jesse uh, using physiology and scan code. And we saw about 940 different license texts detected by the scanner in the kernel. In 413, when we actually looked at things again in 413, um, in 2017 for the 413 kernel, there was over 1,020 plus different license texts. 700 were variants of GPL. But those are all things that the, these scanners have to try to figure out. And what's obvious to you and me when we just sort of look at it isn't necessarily obvious to the scanners. Or it, makes, it means all these people are having to do manual intervention or memorizing it and then reapplying it and setting up complicated databases. And at the time of 413, there was 11,000 files without a license, which also needs to be fixed. So accurately summarizing this, um, 
the licenses, once they're detected and the obligations are stood, you do need to do that to comply. You're using open source. It's a gift by the author to you. So you need to respect their, what their wishes are. So you have to figure out what they want you to do. And um, MIT, MPL, Artistic are there. And then the API files needed to have this is called note. And these ambiguities needed to be resolved. So uh, some work started, I guess, in 2017, early 2017, looking at it. And discussions were happening in the kernel community. And um, there was precedent out there already. U-Boot had started much earlier. And a variety of other projects had been adopting the identifier, so there was precedent. And so the kernel community, with their discussions, um, was receptive. And thanks to Greg and to Thomas and to Grant and some of the other friends I see in the audience, <laughs> and um, you know there was receptivity to actually starting to look at cleaning this problem up and solving this problem. So um, work, was, work was done manually to take the two outputs of two scanners, diffing them, using this, and creating a great big spreadsheet, and then seeing where they agreed, where they disagreed and then cross-checked with a third scanner. But Philippe Oberdam, myself, Thomas Glexner, Greg, and Steve Winslow all logged well over two, hours, two weeks of manual effort in this project, trying to get a handle on what the licensing actually was and where we should um, be able to automate what we shouldn't. And so hopefully once we do this sort of thing, no one else has to do it, <laughs> is the hope. Um, what we saw in the 4.13, is there was a large number of licenses that were preferred and everyone was reasonably comfortable with they were there. We saw some other ones that are there <laughs> um, and make sense in certain contexts and are not necessarily as issues. And then we saw a bunch of exceptions showing up and this is called note is one of the areas that we need to make sure and then there were 86 unique licenses detected from the work. So like I say, when you say it's GPL2 only, uh, I don't know, there's a little bit more than that there. At the time of 4.13, um, when we did the analysis, well over two-thirds are GPL, two, or, two, or later. And then, we have a, then there's a nice long tail down from there. And at the time, there was about 11,000 files uh, without licenses at all. So we've now sorted the, um, with, at 4.14, um, it got sorted, but um, the normal system calls were the things that we actually had to get that whole identifier added. And this identifier over here um, is a sample of what you'd see if you went to the SPDX page. And this is where it's been templatized behind the scenes and you can query it and work with it as a data type. And you know, the things that you'll see are things like it's GPL2 or later with the Linux syscall note because it's a user space API or the file is BSD because it's come in from another place where it was BSD and so you have to they said it can be dual licensed when they put it in. And this is fairly common, actually. That, that clause is fairly common in some drivers. Um, with 4.14, though, um, after the maintainer summit in October in Europe, um, there was enough discussion that happened. And there's a really good write-up in LWN. And I encourage you, if you're curious about more of the details, but um, the word it was approved how that we could be adding SPDX identifiers into the kernel. Before that 4.14, um, there were about 73 files that actually had identifiers in them already. And then after 4.14, um, all the missing ones had the GPL 2.0 based on copying added to them. And the user space APIs got sorted. So 11,000 files suddenly added license IDs and another 1,500 roughly uh, were user space APIs that were documented explicitly as such. So as part of that um, maintainer summit, there were some guidelines given as to how you should uh, document the identifier. It should be the first line in a file. And it has been documented and added into the kernel. And it's formally in the kernel documentation as to what you should do. Um, the biggest source of pushback we saw is the use of using slash slash in C source files. But Linus basically said that's what he wanted to see. And so that's what we went with. And 
Again, we've got write-ups on this, and as you see, it's a fairly straightforward format. However, by having that tag there, all of a sudden now, we can grep. We can grep for that tag and get a good list of the licenses. So, as we make our progress here, we do git grep SPDX identifier. We start to see things like this. And then if you do a little bit of cleanup on, on top of this in terms of the formatting of the comment notations, you can aggregate it further. And very quickly, you can start to see the summary of the licensing. At this point in time, a third of the kernel's files now have licensing. So there's two thirds that are still not represented by this Git rep, but we're making progress. So here's the, um, we did, I ran some of the scripts. And as you can see, now we're now at the third um, that have the identifiers, so you can grep for them. And it's a slow up ramp, and the ask is anyone who's interested and willing to help here, um, if you have copyright or you're working for a company that has copyright, please go in and add the identifiers to your files and get rid of the erroneous boilerplates and clean it up. So um, it's going to take you know either a lot more sophisticated scripting and work on that direction, but. Hopefully we'll get ourselves to the fact that we have everything up there. Check patch already now has update um, checks in it and making sure that the new commits have them. And we need to sort of continue it on. So just some specifics from last week. Um, the RC2 kernel, um, 21,000 files had the identifiers in them now. Uh, for those who follow LKML, in detail, uh, Thomas found a bunch recently that the identifier was disagreeing with the text and flagged it, and basically people happily fix it. No one is going to be unhappy about fixing things, or at least most people aren't, or if it's ambiguous. But we need to get it so that we don't have to fix things and reconcile them. It's just one identifier, which is less easy to uh, make mistakes. Um, mistakes get made in this identifier, um, but over time, hopefully, we'll get those cleaned up as well. But it's easier to fix an identifier that you found than to search random text strings for all the information. So I think it's progress in the right direction. However, it would be lovely if it went faster. Uh, where are they um, in 5.0 five right now? Well, I think the Arch directory still needs a lot of work as does drivers. So I think those are the two big areas, such as if you've got files in there, or you've got, or you know, or you work for a company that's got files, um, having a look there and helping out to clean those up. Um, the file system, and includes, has some, but I think at the end of the day, the drivers and arch are the big focus points uh, to get us to the, those last you know, two thirds. Um, at the documentation um, area, it's not completely clear what we should be aiming at yet there, and so I'm having discussions with John Corbett on what we should be working for there, and it's part of that. And then we'll probably try to get that information reflected into the ecosystem. So with that, um, if people are interested in trying to help us clarify the licensing info, I guess the first thing is you know, if there's any question as to what the licenses is, if it doesn't match the preferred licenses, or it's unclear or unspecified, um, you need to figure out who you can ask. Um, there are, the maintainer is obviously one person that you should be reaching out to, so the maintainer where the file belongs under, if there's guidance, but then you can look at the contributors to the file, as well as the copyright holders that are indicated in the file. And those are the ones that can provide guidance for any changes you want to do for fixing things up. You have to be careful um, with just using straight Git and some of the tools based on Git in the sense that the submitter may not be the actual author and copyright holder. Um, in 4.11, we had a pretty clear example of this, uh, that someone actually ended up as the most active developer and he was helping someone else and the tools basically tracked it on by him. 
So while Git has a lot of the information, we use it extensively for trying to get provenance information. Um, it isn't always, it, it doesn't contain all this accuracy that you'd like. So in terms of trying to identify the copyright holders, working with the contributors is probably your best bet if you don't know explicitly. The copyright statements in the kernel, um, I'll tell you right out, are usually right when they're added and then they drift over time, okay? Um, and we see people going in and adding their copyright statements when they really don't have necessary content in a file. <laughs> um, so one of the examples here that some of you guys know about, I guess, is McCarty. Um, went and added his copyright into this file and it's clear that he only had made minor commits to it based on what we could tell from the data. So uh, roughly less than 3%, well, 4% of the, to the tokens were his. Whereas the top person out of over a third of it isn't even indicated in the copyrights. Okay, so this is why data mining starts to get really interesting here. Um, there's a tool that we've put out, uh, output for the Linux kernel called Cregit, um, cregitlinuxsources.org. It's got a new interface, so it can help you figure out who to talk to. And it just sort of summarizes at the top now who the key contributors it's been able to figure out from Git are. And um, if you mouse over a contribution, it'll pop up where the commit is. You can go and see the commit directly where it was added. And in some cases, not 100% definitely, but in some cases, you can actually also mouse over a commit variable and um, see the discussion on LKML and patch list, patchworks before that um, commit was added. So we've got researchers trying to hook up the mail list context and discussion before the commits are made. But uh, Cregit pretty much takes it down to the variable level rather than the line level. Use the same basic git blame methodology, but we'll take it down to the line level. So I guess with that, um, where are we going next? Other than obviously doing our work, working with people to try to get things cleaned up and help them understand who's there. Um, obviously, there's the 41,000 files that need to get cleaned up. Um, working with the docs team and figure out what the best recommendations are for that part of the tree. And then obviously resolving some of the files with ambiguous license headers or the problematic licenses. Some of them, they're not on the preferred list. So these will be the things that are being focused on and they're being focused on very quietly in the background bit by bit. I'd love to get a big leap and suddenly make that burned up, burn up chart significant, but um, you know, dealt with. Uh, and so if people have good ideas on how to make it go faster, I'm definitely interested. <laughs> but I'll take, quite frankly, the progress we've been seeing because it's a lot better than it's been for the last several years. So if you want to help, um, add the identifiers and make the GPL license references consistent. Um, if you and your company own the copyrights and the code. And um, we've already had ARM, Lenaro, Linutronics, Linux Foundation, obviously, IBM, Intel, and Samsung have been very public about expressing the fact that they're moving in this direction. And um, they've basically also, like, you know, Intel has published a blog, Samsung published a blog. It suddenly disappeared, so I didn't put the link up, but Samsung published a blog last year, too, about how they're cleaning things up and moving forward. And certainly, reach out to me. So pretty much in summary, um, the kernel is primarily GPL2, um, but other licenses are present and do need to be complied with. Um, we all now, all files after 4.14 have a license indicated in them in some form, and which finally, fulfilled the expectation of the DCO that the license indicated in the file was there. And the SPDX identifier tags, um, adding them will simplify our analysis in the future and help enable the automation. So from that perspective and from the perspective of people using the kernel, it makes it easier to understand all the licenses and then comply. So at the end, I guess copyright holders are the authorities to sign off on cleaning up and removal of bad licensing references and you may need to do some analysis and provenance since we've got some tooling to help. And I guess with that, um, people have questions. Does anybody have a question?
Go for it. This is a great effort. Well done. Um, could we ever see this tag being used instead of having the license header and files? Uh, yeah, actually, a lot of people, when they're going in right now, uh, if things are wrong, are removing the bad references. So bad, the bad template. The, 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 header or just yeah, they're removing the bad headers. Awesome. You're leaving copyrights in, and, but they're removing the bad headers if the copyright holder approves. Yeah, it makes it nice and small and simple. You don't have to wait through a page of boilerplate before you actually see code, which is the reason they actually started doing it in U-Boot. So U-Boot actually started removing the headers, right? You know, only going to the SPDX identifiers as headers at the start about six years ago. Any other questions? <laughs> so I have a lot of questions, but I'll only ask one for now. Um, so I'm curious how you're uh, looking forward uh, to handling the fact when you discover um, exceptions on code uh, that are not, don't yet have an SPDX identifier. You know, so, so if there's kind of this mismatch, right? Because it, because the process of SPDX trying to make an identifier and then people want to put sure. the put it in. How how is that process all going to work? And how are we going to um, be able to SP more quickly handle that issue? Okay. <laughs> the more quickly is an interesting challenge because we're dealing with a team of lawyers here. Okay, um, that are reviewing things for going into the list. And they work as fast as they can. Um, and if it's non-controversial, it's pretty quick. If there's controversy, it slows down. That's the way it works. Um, the SPDX license list um, has a is on GitHub, um, open it, and on the web web page, there's also links to where you open a request for a license to go in. If you're finding some text in a code that does not match in with an existing license. Um, I actually had a developer reach out to me um, about three weeks ago with some identifiers that, okay, these are these files, what should they be under? Some clearly match BSD, some match GPL. Others um, were things that, again, had been copied in from places over time and we don't have a good match. Today, if you find something, you want to put something, you can put a license ref to indicate it's there and to make sure that the code is, that actual code is copied and available. But um, the, the plan is to actually work with either getting the license discussed with the copyright holders if they can change the license to a preferred license, if it's ambiguous what it is, or else work with the SPDX identifying crew to encode what's missing. If we can't get the provenance, we can't reach out to the copyright holders, like we did with the Band. So the open infinite Band example was how we did that one. And there's about four or five cases right now that I know are going on in the background with, with SC areas where we don't have something clearly defined. Any other questions? Come on, Bradley. <laughs> so you use that Craigit reference to say to reference uh, Patrick's uh, copyright notice being in there. Um, I actually, uh, first of all, I completely agree with you that it's a mistake to put in copyright notices. Uh, because they're never maintained. That's been a historical, we agree about that, that historically it's been really bad. So putting them in just makes th things more complicated because never everybody wants to put theirs in or they fail to and then it's not correct anymore. Uh, but in that particular case, I, I actually wanted to, to, to find out because I, I pulled up that commit. Um, so are you saying that his changes were not copyrightable changes? In no, I'm, not, I'm saying they're fine, but I'm saying in the scope of the people to consult here, I basically tried to make sure you catch the <clears throat> You know, I'd say that the five or six people ahead of him are more important to discuss this with. But but he still he still does have copyright, so it's legitimate, I think, for him to put his copyright notice in there, even if it's ill-advised, right? It is, and it's also disrespectful of the other authors in some ways too. Well, so can, can you tell me more about that? Why is it disrespectful if you have a copyright in a file and you do want it out of copyright notice? Why is it disrespectful to add it when you when you have made a copyrightable change? Um. It is not just. Yeah, he should be including the others. I would agree. That's a good way of phrasing it. Well, it, it seems to me it's unfair to require anybody who wants to have a copyright notice. They have to go through the process of vetting the copyright history of the file. That seems like a pretty big burden to ask people. Well, we've got these. Like I say, if people want to go in and add the copyrights, it's up to the maintainers to accept their, their changes. This tooling is here to help you understand the history of what is there now. 
And what is there? It is not, you know, you can go look at 4.7, and you can look up to 4.20, and we'll add 5.0 when it comes out too. But it only shows you what is there now, and code changes so rapidly. You saw the stats, nine changes an hour, it's gonna touch. You know, so subsystems get reworked all the time to make them better, and code will shift. Um, I just use that example because it's known for, to some people in the industry. Yeah, yeah, and, and okay. I agree with you removing the copyright notice. But if you and can get all the authors to agree to not, of course you have to, of course once the copyright notice is there, you have to get the author to agree to remove it, right? Is that in the, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, if yeah. you want to remove the copyright notice, you definitely yeah, need yeah. the author, yeah. author to I, agree, I agree no you question. Should ask, you should on the other the hand, sure. on the other hand, if you could get, um, you know, the top five here, or um, the, basically the top five are Kumar, Kieran Kumar, to basically say, hey, um, can we put, Instead of having that boilerplate for the GPL, can we put an identifier on the top? That seems to be a reasonable ask. Especially if someone's asked and they're non-responsive too. If they don't respond back. They shouldn't have a veto block on things either. If the rest of them do. Yeah, no, you can't remove the copyright. Or I think we're all completely agreed on that. But you can clean up the licensing. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, well, thank in you that, very much. In that case, okay, thank you very much. Yes.